Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Goble. I am uh, currently a research fellow in the emergency department. Um, mostly work in Springfield, also work at um, the community hospitals, mostly spend a lot of time with Noble. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you sort of about the ED perspective on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, no one gives me any money. Uh, half the time, actually, Bay State forgets to pay me. Um, so if anyone is offering a financial conflict of interest, I'd love to talk to you during the break. So I'm going to divide this sort of into two parts, um, <clears throat> the handover and the treatments for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and when I'm talking about the handover, um, I don't necessarily mean the communication part with the story and everything. I mean the actual process. Um, I think that the handover portion, moving the patient over and all of the, 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 the logistics involved, is the most critical procedure in transitioning the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patient, but it is the most underrated procedure. Um, there's three things that I kind of care about in that, in that process. Um, the end title, the physical moving of the patient, and then getting them on the Lucas device. Number one is the end title. Um, if you ask me to run an arrest, but I only got to pick one thing to monitor, I would not pick the EKG. I would pick the end title. It is the first thing that I look at when the patient is being brought into the room by EMS. That's what I'm peering over, looking at their monitor. And that's the first thing that I want connected to the patient as soon as they're moved over. There's several reasons for that. One, it immediately tells me that ventilation is occurring through the airway, that the airway is patent. And two, it gives me a lot of prognostic information. Low end titles are associated with uh, poor outcomes. A spike in end title indicates ROSC. And it also tells me how good our resuscitation is going so far. If we've got like a decent end title, like greater than 20, then I know that we're getting good perfusion. We've had good quality CPR going on. So the actual move, I think this part is the most dangerous part, the most dangerous part of the transition from EMS to hospital. This is when the airway gets lost. This is when the lines get pulled out. This is when someone gets a needle stick because the IV that we lost track of is tied up in the sheets and they were going to reach to move the patient. Um, I try to get everyone to kind of slow down and do this in an organized fashion to prevent those things from happening. You know, we're lucky at the at Bay, at, uh, Bay State Medical Center because we always have a physician that's up there to manage the airway in addition to the physician that's uh, running the arrest as the team leader. So they're going to be uh, bird dogging the airway and making sure nothing happens. But um, something I'm trying to introduce people to with all of the lines and wires is to gather them all to a single point on the patient and gather them all to a single point on the stretcher. And you can have one person whose job it is to hold on to the patient side and hold on to the stretcher side so that if there's going to be any tugging, that they can be acutely aware of it and help let the rest of the team know and also just kind of like manage that. Um, that's a strategy that uh, is also helpful when you're like trying to transfer an ECMO patient like onto a CT scan or a back off or something. And then the third thing I mentioned, the Lucas device. Um, if the patient is not already on the Lucas device, one of my top priorities is to get them on it as soon as possible. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, so with one of the um, criticisms that's been laid at the Lucas is that if there isn't a, a shown patient-oriented benefit for all comers in hospital cardi uh, in uh, cardiac arrest. Um, but there is definitely a provider-oriented benefit, and I'm selfish, so I want to go with that. Um, for EMS, this is the only way to safely transport a patient that is in cardiac arrest, full stop. It's the only way that you can stay restrained in the ambulance. <clears throat> and in the hospital, this means that there's a bunch fewer people that I have to have in the room, so it's not as crowded, it's not as sweaty, and it just brings the tone down, and I like that. So. I will make this a priority to get on the patient. Um, a fun fact about the Lucas is that the backplate is actually wider than a standard backboard. So assuming that your patient is not wider than the backboard, you can actually put this, you can actually put the backboard directly onto the backplate and then put the Lucas over the top of it. So let's talk about the treatments or lack thereof. So for a long time, 
we did not have anything to really offer cardiac arrest patients, right? I mean, tobacco smoke enema, like, right, that's where the term blown smoke up your ass comes from, because this is stuff we tried. And eventually, we came to defibrillation and drugs, but these were restricted to being done in the hospital setting. And so at a time when all the ambulances were hearses and the ambulance drivers were called that because they were literally just ambulance drivers, you know, they were the undertaker the rest of the time, um, the message was just get them to the hospital, just get them here because we had all the magic. <clears throat> but you know, by the, you know, 2008, 2010, um, EMS was established as well-trained professionals that could do all the stuff that we have to offer at the hospital. They can manage the airway, they can give drugs, they can shock. Epi doesn't work better at the hospital. And in fact, when, so we switched the messaging to, no, just stay on scene and run the arrest on scene. And we found that we had better outcomes with that. But now, uh, and also it's unsafe to, you know, go lights and sirens through traffic with running a, an arrest in the back, because it's not only the risk of the people in the back that are trying to do the CPR and everything while the ambulance is moving, there's that secondary risk to going lights and sirens. Are you gonna cause an accident? Are you gonna be in an accident? But now, we have the ability to transport safely, right? Because we can do mechanical CPR. But what do we have at the hospital that isn't necessarily available in the field? Um, well, that's ECMO. And so now some of the messaging for a select group of patients is switching to no, just get here. Um, in, you know, this has been mentioned several times now throughout these talks, but one of the biggest, probably the biggest challenge in initiating ECMO at the hospital for a cardiac arrest patient is getting them there in time because we need to get them on the pump, on bypass within about an hour of the arrest. And if you stay on scene and you run it for 20 minutes first, that's not going to happen. So the change, the difficult thing in these systems is switching that mindset again to just get here for the select group of patients. But again, as uh, Matt Sterling uh, stole my thunder, um, the ECMO is not limited to being an in-hospital intervention. In Paris, they do it pre-hospitally, not just in the subway, but also at the Louvre. Um, and this is also not limited to outside the United States. Um, in the Minnesota Twin Cities area, um, where they did the arrest trial, Dr. Yiannopoulos, um, they now have a specially modified ambulance with a C-arm and everything in the back, so they use it like the cath lab to put the patient on ECMO pre-hospital. And in Albuquerque, um, they have a not-so-modified ambulance that they use um, where they're doing everything with ultrasound confirmation to put patients on um, pre-hospital ECMO. And in the Netherlands, as an extension of their helicopter EMS service, they now have countrywide coverage for pre-hospital ECMO. You have a cardiac arrest anywhere in the Netherlands, a helicopter will be on scene within 30 minutes to put you on ECMO if you meet the criteria. So the question is, you know, does it work, right? That's sort of the big question. Um, there's a, this is a very hot topic for research right now, so there's stuff coming out all the time. I'm just gonna highlight two um, of the more recent trials. The arrest trial in 2020, which the previous speaker mentioned had a 43% uh, neurointact survival in the ECMO group. Um, and then the Prague tri trial that came out this year, 2022, showed about a 31.5% survival, which is around where most of these trials show. It's a 30-ish percent survival. Um, but there was actually no statistically significant improvement in the ECMO versus the non-ECMO group. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So I think the summary of the evidence is that we have about a 35% neurointact survival for patients that have been arresting for about an hour. And I don't need to cite any literature to the people in this room. You know that if someone's been coding for an hour, they have nowhere near a 35% chance of coming out of that neurointact. So this really is a remarkable intervention in that regard. But the other argument I'm going to make <clears throat> is that Putting in place a eCPR or an ECMO program improves the care for your non-ECMO patients. Now, anecdotally, 
different centers that they as they've implemented this have observed they're like yeah you know we saw a bump in our uh, in our non ECMO patients in, in the survival but specifically in the Prague study um, at the conference when they were releasing uh, the results and presenting them the lead author was up there and he said yeah so we powered our trial. Uh, to assume that we would have about 30-ish percent survival in the ECMO arm and 10 percent survival in our non-ECMO arm because that's what it's been forever. But as soon as they implemented ECMO and they were doing all this extra training and emphasis on resuscitation, the survival in their non-ECMO arm jumped to 22 percent. And so that's why there was uh, no difference that they found. Not because ECMO doesn't work, but because implementing ECMO got them such a bump in their non-ECMO group that the, the statistical significance vanished. And so my argument is that the training, in order to do ECMO, you have to be on top of your game. You have to be excellent resuscitationists and you have to train and train and train so that you can run these arrests perfectly. And what ends up happening is your patients that are not eligible for ECMO also benefit from it. So is it worth it to pursue ECMO, especially trying to do a pre-hospital ECMO program? So I think we're at a point with this right now where we are trying to move the ball down the field in cardiac arrest to get patients to the next thing, whatever that is, so that we can figure it out. And what exactly do I mean by that? I'll take an example from the trauma literature. So we originally, we had lots of soldiers dying on the battlefield. And then we started using tourniquets and they were no longer dying on the battlefield. They were dying in the forward hospitals in the operating room. And until we figured out that we, be, we needed to do damage control surgery instead of the other uh, way that they were doing surgery before, sometimes leave an open abdomen, and sometimes they just pack and run, you just do the bare minimum, then move them on to the next thing. Then we started getting people out of the ORs and then into the ICUs back into you know, Germany and the US to recover. But then we had patients that were having all these horrible long-term outcomes, and they were very debilitated. And that's because we hadn't had people that had survived that yet to be able to figure out how to do the rehab and the prosthetics and the other stuff they needed to return to life. And so now, every time there's this major advancement, we're bolusing patients further down in their care so that we can figure out what to do with them next. And I think that's where we are with cardiac arrest right now, especially with on the precipice of being able to do ECMO um, and getting a larger group of people onto the next thing so we can figure out the rehab and the long-term care and the other stuff. And it's going to take a while to catch up with that. Um, so that's what I have for you, that I think the handover and the physical moving of the patient is the most critical procedure in the transition to arrest, but is totally underrated, um, and that I think ECMO is coming.